Welcome to our Sunday morning service, June 21st. Happy Father's Day to everyone. Shall we bow for prayer? Father, thank you for your presence. We pray that by your spirit, you will use your word to speak to everyone's heart who hears this message. Thank you for the sound men and all the men and women who help with this uh, service, online service. Pray your blessing upon them. May you receive all the glory, dear Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we turn to hymn number two? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. we turn to hymn number 33, How Great Thou Art.
This time I'm going to read Isaiah 49. Then we'll have the message for every generation. After which we'll see in closing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Isaiah 49. Wonderful word. Isaiah 49. Listen to me, you islands, hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to himself and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, is it too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept? I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel. To him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servants, servant of rulers, kings will see you and rise up. Princes will see him bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritance to say to the captives, come out and to those in darkness, be free. They will feed because the roads, they will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat upon them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. I will turn all my mountains into roads and my highways will be raised up. See, they will come from afar, some from the north, some from the west. Some from the region of Aswan. Shout for joy, O heavens. Rejoice, O earth. Burst into song, O mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Your sons hasten back, and those who laid you waste depart from you. Lift up your eyes and look around. All your sons gather and come to you. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, you will wear them all as ornaments. You will put them on like a bride. Though you were ruined and made desolate and your land laid waste, now you will be too small for your people, and those who devoured you will be far away. The children born during your bereavement yet will, yet will yet say in your hearing, This place is too small for us. Give us more space to live in. Then you will say in your heart, Who bore me these? I was bereaved and barren. I was exiled and rejected. Who brought these up? I was left all alone. But these, where have they come from? This is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I will beckon to the Gentiles. I will lift up my banner to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their shoulders. Kings will be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. They will bow down before you with their faces to the ground. They will lick the dust at your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed can plunder be taken from warriors or captives rescued from the fierce? But this is what the Lord says. Yes, captives will be taken from warriors and plunder retrieved 
from the fierce. I will contend with those who contend with you. And your children I will save. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh. They will be drunk on their own blood as with wine. Then all mankind will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. We thank the Lord for his eternal word. This message is for every generation. For every generation. This wonderful text of Isaiah 49 embraces the reality of the Messiah. Isaiah is believed to have written this, inspired by the Spirit, between 740 and 680 B.C. 740 and 680 B.C. Almost 700 years before the birth of Jesus. But as we read this word of God, you will think we're reading today's newspaper and the reality of God's work in the world and what he is doing through the people of Israel, through the church, through our own lives. The wonderful word of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, if you want to write down these verses when I preach this message on a piece of paper so you can look at them later, feel free to because I'll be referring to several passages and the reality of, of the all-embracing God that we serve who loves us and wants us to know him. In 1 uh, Timothy 3.16 reads this way. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. The reality of the person of Jesus Christ. The first four verses here center on Jesus, the Messiah. The reality of Jesus' birth, his identity, and his purpose. It embraces the humility of Jesus. Imagine the God of glory coming into this world, becoming human, incarnate, feeling all we feel, understanding how we think. As one writer in Hebrew says, this Jesus is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows all that we're going through, even now today. The reality of his birth as it would be foretold that Jesus would be born and described even by uh, Joseph in the reality of all that, uh, that he went through in Mary and the birth of Jesus, his questioning about Jesus. And yet God would speak to him the reality of his own personal experience. God would prepare people like Elizabeth and Zacharias and the birth of John the Baptist, and particularly with Jesus, the wonderful reality of his birth. Joseph, if you remember, would question Mary because she was pregnant. And he knew that this birth would not be his child. As Joseph considered divorcing Mary quietly, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, he considered, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The reality, even a prophecy, of another prophecy of Isaiah, much on the person of Jesus. Jesus, his identity of who he is and his purpose to die for our sins coming into the world. And the humanity of Jesus in all he experienced in relationship with the Father in ministry. The question of his own parents as he would be 12 years old and he wanted to be in his father's house. The question of Jesus with, with his friend Lazarus who had passed away. 
And Jesus wept in John chapter 11, if you would read, Jesus wept. The struggles that Jesus had in the reality of dying for our sins and his petition before the Father, and yet he prayed his will would be done. Jesus, it's hard to describe because we cannot relate. I cannot relate how the incarnate Son of God understood and felt all we felt. We believe what his word declares. Jesus would cry out to the Father, praying if it is that for this cup to be taken from him. Nevertheless, your will be done. And I want to find that for you. So you can write it down to look it up. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus prayed in Luke 22, 42. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. The reality of this experience of Jesus Christ, I don't believe anyone could ever relate to. People have gone through difficulties and discouragement and fallen into despondency. But this reality, reality of Jesus and all he went through, we read in the word, but I do not believe I can fully understand or comprehend. This alone, Jesus took upon himself all the sins of the world in the past, present, and the future. And yet he willingly bore this for us. But there is in Isaiah 49 these words. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand and my reward is with my God. Jesus in his own prayer life was willing to take the father's will. To be obedient to the Father's will. And yet Jesus, the word says, voluntarily gave himself. But he also prayed, Father, glorify me with thine own self that I had with thee before the world was in John 17, 5. The reality of Jesus and all he went through. This is also parallel in one sense with the work of the Spirit in our lives since Pentecost, that God by his spirit through Jesus' death and resurrection calls all people everywhere to repentance and faith in Christ. And it is a work of grace in our lives, a work of grace, God's kindness and blessing for us. What is very interesting in Luke chapter 1, verse 28, there's a word, particular word, that's only used twice in the Greek. In Luke 1, 28, the angel Gabriel is saying to Mary, the angel went to her and said, greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. This word highly favored, displaying grace and kindness. God's divine grace is also used in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, or rather chapter 1 verse 6. About all of us who were called by God to faith in Christ, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. This word of grace, divine grace, blessing that Gabriel expressed to Mary is the same word God uses expressed to everyone who is called chosen in Christ before the world began. Before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. We experience the birth as Jesus would talk to Nicodemus. The reality in John chapter 3 that we must be born again. We must be regenerated. We must allow God to create within us new life. And yet the ministry of Jesus revealed his heart, his birth. His identity, he received from the Father the word in John 17, 5 at his baptism. This is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. The identity of Jesus and the purpose he came in his heart for all people. 
And Matthew 23, 37 reveals the heart of Jesus, the miraculous, wonderful incarnate birth of Jesus, his identity as God incarnate, and his heart in ministry. And Matthew 23 reveals his heart. Toward the end of his life, as he traveled proclaiming his gospel, Many would not receive his message. And he said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. God has the heart of wanting to draw all people unto himself as a hen gathers her chicks. The one who created the world the one who made man in his own image came into the world in the person of Jesus Christ and died for our sins and rose again. But such is not the heart of man in himself. One example I'm going to read, even about a chicken, as God would gather us together as a hen gathers her chicks. Ravi Zacharias and came and live without God and pray for Ravi's family. He went to be with the Lord recently wonderful servant of Christ. He talks about Stalin. Joseph Stalin, believe it or not, in his book said the incredible irony of his whole life. At one time, Joseph Stalin had been a seminary student preparing for the ministry. But he had a break in his belief in God. And that dramatic and complete reversal of his conviction resulted in his hatred of all religion is why Leonard had earlier chosen Stalin and positioned him in authority. We talk about in Russia the reality of what her, uh, occurred under Stalin's life. Even as he lay dying, it is said that one of his last breaths and his last gesture was a clenched fist toward God, and his heart is cold and hard as steel. In his anti-theism, that is, anti-God and anti-believing in God, he masterminded a large scale, a large murder scale of his own people, some 15 million people. On one occasion, as he revealed his leadership to those who would follow him, it is said Stalin took a live chicken. He proceeded to make an unforgettable point before some of his henchmen, forcefully, forcefully clutching the chicken in one hand, while the other he began systematically to pluck the feathers out of the chicken, the live chicken. As the chicken struggled in vain to escape, he continued with a painful denuding until the bird was completely stripped. Now you watch, said Stalin, placed a chicken on the floor, walked away with some breadcrumbs in his hand, and incredibly, the fear-crazed chicken hobbled toward him and clung to the legs of his trousers. Stalin threw a handful of grain to the bird and began to follow him around the, around the room, and he turned to his dumbfounded colleagues and said quietly, this is the way to rule people. Do you see how that chicken followed me for food? And even though I caused it such torture, people are like that chicken. If you inflict inordinate pain on them, they will follow you for food for the rest of their lives. Sad story of someone who killed 15 million of their own people. And millions more would be killed by Hitler and other people who denounce a relationship with God, have nothing to do with him. And yet Jesus, the heart of God, would gather people like a hen gathers her chicks. What a heart difference. God calls people to himself in love and faithfulness. And the reality, he wants us to know him. Jesus weeps for people. He wants them to know him. He created us. He died for us. In the garden, he, though in his humanity, 
he prayed, Father, thy will be done. The word of God says in Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, his word is the focus. For the word of God is living in Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God already knows everything about us. From the inside out. And he is speaking to our hearts. In our walk with him. This birth of Jesus. The identity of Jesus. The purpose. Also relates to us. God calls us to be born again. A new birth. Our identity is in Jesus. And each of us has a purpose to fulfill. In a loving relationship. With our father. We are called, I'm called to be a pastor. You might not be called to be a pastor. You're called to be a truck driver or a doctor or a nurse or a musician. You're called to be a farmer. We, as we come to repentance and faith in Christ, we are placed in the body of Christ. And each of us has a particular function to fulfill. The Apostle Paul even said in 1 Corinthians, Paulus water, I planted a Paulus water. God gave the increase. We are each to be involved in reaching other people for Jesus. Jesus passed on the reality of ministry to people like Peter and Paul and to you and myself. Peter is a apostle to the Gentiles. Paul, apostle, I mean, Peter, apostle to the Jews. Paul, an apostle to the Gentiles. That God is wanting us to, to be used by him to reach other people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 49, it's particularly noted that we go through this as Jesus identified with us and understands how we feel and think as people. We can become easily discouraged in our walk with him. It's particularly when wickedness occurs. Jesus said in, in Matthew, Chapter 23. Of how we would like to bring people under his wings as a chicken gathers her chicks under his wings. But he says in the next chapter, in verse 24, when wickedness occurs, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And I would say in the last several months, you and I have seen wickedness that has occurred in the world. And it's particularly discouraging. And wickedness can occur in several forms. In Psalm 73, there's a psalmist that talks about wickedness. God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. We can be born again. We can identify ourselves with the person and the message of Jesus. We even may be living for Jesus and want to love and serve him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and neighbors ourselves. But we can see wickedness have a toll upon our minds and our hearts. And this person says, as for me, my, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And this person says, surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. Sometimes a person might even say, well, Lord, I've received you. Why is this happening? Why is this occurring? We can have our doubts and questions. But if we allow the word of God to speak to our minds and hearts, God can help us through those difficult days in our minds. This psalmist says, when I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. What's particularly interesting in Ecclesiastes 8, and these words might even remind your mind about things that have occurred in the last several weeks. 
in Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. Think of this. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. When the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. Although a wicked man commits a hundred crimes and still lives a long time, I know that it will go better with God-fearing men who are reverent before God. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. Righteous men who get what the wicked deserve and wicked men who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. So I commend the enjoyment of life because nothing is better for a man under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany him in his work all the days of life, the life God has given him under the sun. Now you may think you are not affected, maybe you're not, by what occurs on the last several months. As I have talked to maybe farmers and say, well, we're still working like we always did. Not much has changed. So I'm called, I'm saved, I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I'm a farmer, I identify with Jesus, and I want to live for him and my purpose. But what if you're a school teacher? What if you're a policeman? You're part of the body of Christ, you received Jesus, you identify with Jesus' message and his person, and you want to live for him, but you're a school teacher. Has it been the same the last several months? Has it been the same now for police officers who know Jesus? And in fact, even if you are a farmer and one that you are someone else, that this has not really affected a whole lot, have you sensed or felt that all you've worked for will not last? What will happen to all I've tried to do? Because in Psalm in Isaiah 49, it says, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain for nothing. And in fact, in chapter 49, verse 14, it's repeated. The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. And sometimes people think that when we're discouraged. But I would remind us that our Lord, Jesus Christ, who came into the world and died for our sins, rose again, is always present with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And during this time of questioning and doubting, we still have the same mission. Was it easy for Peter? No, Peter, God worked in his life to open his mind and heart, even to Gentiles. He went to Cornelius' house. And God did a tremendous work in the Apostle Paul's life to convert him to be a, a, a bearer of the gospel to the Gentiles. And they suffered a lot. And sometimes I think we think we avoid this suffering thing. But Colossians chapter 1 verse 24 talks about suffering. And the reality that sometimes we suffer in our faith for Jesus. And God does a work in our lives in the midst of suffering. As we, as we love and serve him. I'm trying to get to Colossians chapter 1. In 124, Paul saying, I rejoice in what was suffered for you. And I fell up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by commission God gave to me to present you the word of God in fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is important is what the Lord says. The God who caused us to be born of his spirit, to identify with the person of Jesus Christ and his message, and whatever our function is, whether to be a farmer or a pastor or, or, or a school teacher, or a policeman, that we are to keep our eyes on Jesus. This mission is a global mission. We are part of, of the people group 
from apostles to us to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ to tell people about him. God reminds us of his faithfulness. In Isaiah 49, he says, the Lord says, it is, is it a small thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob? Sometimes we think of ourselves as not having much of a part. But the Lord says, your part is bigger than you think. Because each of us can be in our prayer lives praying and planting and watering the word of God in someone else's life to know Jesus. Only God knows how far that word will go to reach others with the gospel of Jesus. He reminds us of, of his faithfulness. The reality that God moves us from darkness to light. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. In the day of salvation, I will help you. I will, I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land and to, re, to reassign its desolate inheritance. To say to the captives, come out to those in darkness, be free. The reality that we're called by Jesus. God is so much with us. That after these people say, the Lord has forsaken me, the Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. God wrote with his finger on a stone the word to Moses. But God, in the person of Jesus Christ, wrote our names in the palm of his hands on the cross. Everybody's name. When you repent of your sin and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, those same hands write your name in the Lamb's book of life. Because Jesus died for everybody. But only those who repent and receive as Lord and Savior is his blood applied for remission of their sins. We belong to him. God's story is being told. And he uses the struggles you and I go, go through in life. Thinking that he has forsaken us. He has not forsaken us. He reveals his glory to us. The glory in the midst of darkness. And he does it every time. He did it after Jesus was born. In the darkness of the night. Those shepherds on the hillside saw the glory of God. And the angelic choir all grouped together, telling them where this Messiah was born and where to go to see him. The glory of God's revelation of his presence in the midst of darkness. My prayer is that you and I will know at this time, see the glimpses of the glory of God through his word that will keep our eyes on Jesus. Looking up, he's the author and finisher of our faith. There are many of those in this congregation are with the Lord in the last 20 years. And knowing where they are right now, they're in the presence of God. John says, I looking up, I looked, and there before me in Revelation 7 is a great multitude that no one can count. Every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now these people whom I love and many love who are with the Lord out of this congregation today are part of that group. They're in chorus saying those words. Before the throne of God, our Father, with Jesus, with his Spirit. The wonderful reality is we are looking for that day when the Lord calls us to be with him. In the meantime, may we realize he wants to use us as lights in the darkness to reach others with his gospel. Shall we sing in hymn number 332, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
Bless you as you read his word and by his spirit comfort and guide and lead you for his glory. Blessings.